meet on this Lord's Day, first Sunday of what? February. Anybody like me looking forward to springtime? I tell you, it felt nice yesterday afternoon, and then all of a sudden I, you know, went out there this morning and got the, again, the, the fresh air of reality, right? A little bit chilly, but uh, praise God, it's good seeing you here this morning, and again, welcome everybody that's online as we get to go and share in God's Word. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to be sharing with you this morning a new message. In fact, it's a message that God gave to me when I was in Ghana this past November in the midst of everything that was going on with COVID and having to travel over there, test before you go, test after you go, and uh, everything, and, and then all the things uh, dealing with in your mind and your fears. And I was uh, in uh, my room, uh, no air conditioning, very hot, and uh, it, it is very ama it's amazing to me how God ministers to you His truth uh, always in your times of need. And He took this very familiar passage and He started giving me truths and ministering to me, uh, God preaching, all right, and hopefully that uh, that's true in your life. I mean, sometimes God just sits you down and preaches to you, all right, and truth, and you listen. So uh, again, he shared this with me, and I was busy, you know, writing down all these thoughts, and so I'm going to be sharing uh, them with you this morning, talking about a life that pleases God, all right, a life that pleases God. Uh, Matt's been talking about renewal. Well, if you want to have a life that's renewed, start living a life, all right, that is focused on pleasing him. Now, before we go into the message this morning, let's bow and ask God's blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to, first of all, thank you for each one that's here this morning. I thank you, dear Lord, for our ability and the health that you've given us to be here. I thank you for everyone who is tuned in online. I ask, dear Lord, for your protection in each home and in each life. Dear Lord, and we thank you for that protection that you've already given to us. We thank you, dear Lord, that your grace is sufficient, that you have redeemed us, and because of that redemption, we do not need to fear, that you have called us by name, and that we know in authority of your word that we are yours as we have put our faith and trust in you. And now this morning, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take your word and you would help each one of us to understand what it is to live a life that would please you. And may the testimony of our lives as we live them out be that they are well-pleasing before your sight. For we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let me start this morning by asking a question and then uh, really uh, giving you a truth that I, I believe that is true for every one of us today. And here's the question. Who are you trying to please in your life? And don't answer it real quick, all right? Why don't you think for a second? Who are you in reality trying to please in your life? Are you trying to please yourself? Everything focused around you? Maybe you're trying to please your husband. Hard thing to do, but maybe that's what you're trying to do. Maybe on the opposite is trying to please, all right, your wife. How about trying to please the kids? Maybe that's even tougher. Or your boss, who you work for, all right? Or friends, people that you're close to. Here's the truth that I believe. All of our lives, I believe every one of us here, our lives are centered around pleasing somebody, all right? They're centered around pleasing somebody. Now, I believe most people, if you observe people, you realize that they seek to please man, all right? When I say man, I'm talking either themselves or husband, wife, or uh, get an employer or whatever, and they seek to please man as a way to get what they feel they need in their life. If I please this person, you ever hear the saying, all right, happy wife, happy life, all right, that's the principle, all right? And that if I please somebody, all right, it's a way to get what, what I want and what I need. And we make, because of this assumption, all right, that we um, make actions, we make choices 
in light of how people are going to respond. In other words, we think, all right, if I do this, this person will respond this way. This will affect me. So I want to manipulate, all right, situations that are going to come out, you know, for, for my good. And we learn this very, very young, don't we? All right. My classic illustration of this, all right, is my youngest daughter, Amy. All right. Uh, she grew up in the church. Basically, say, I, I'm looking at Matt and Amy. You're reliving the life, all right, with little mercy. And I still remember, like, Amy, all right, she'd be sharing as she got a little bit older, about nine years old or whatever she was, and she'd be explaining to the kids at church. Somebody came to me and told me they overheard this conversation. She was saying, I can get my dad to do anything I want him to do. All that I have to do is cry. Boy, and she was right. There's something about it. I don't know if it's you. On the first one, man, I was tough on my oldest son. But when you get older and you have the little girl, am I right? Is this true? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, I, I mean, all of a sudden, man, we're like, we, we melt. Am I right? And see, all I got to do is cry. And I get him to do whatever I want. And somebody was sharing that with me. And the thing of it, it was true. <laughs> all right? But I'm saying kids learn that very young. All right? And it carries on over uh, into our lives. Now, we all battle with this. All right? Uh, Paul talks about this. I'm going to give you a lot of verses this morning. But in Galatians chapter 1, when he was writing to the church of Galatia, he put forth this question, do I seek to please men? In fact, that's exactly what he said. Do I seek to please men? See, Paul's talking about in much of his former life, he lived to please others. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of a, of a religious group that, a group that was very tight, not only in theology but in association, all right? And that really, he lived a life to make sure that he was in right standing with that group. In other words, uh, you dressed a certain way, you act a certain way, you talked a certain way. In other words, they looked at it, if I please them, and they're happy with me, not only do I please them, but I please God, and it's affecting my life in a what? A positive way. I'm getting everything that I desire. So he thought of this as a way of being well-pleasing to the Lord, uh, defending the faith of his fathers, bringing promotion and reward in his life. But now, all right, Paul's a believer. And his life focus, all right, is not going to be on pleasing others, but it's going to be pleasing uh, his Lord. And um, not as a way, by the way, of making other people happy. You know, I'm, I'm not going to follow God to make you happy, all right, or do what God wants me to do to, to have you give me, you know, some kind of validation, a uh, path to get his own way. But just as Enoch, he wanted to bring the light, all right, to his Lord. In fact, um, Hebrews chapter 11, and that great, you know, chapter of faith talks about Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony. Now think about this, all right, a man's testimony. He pleased God. Man, would not that we have that testimony. And then the writer of Hebrew goes on, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to him or come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Well, Paul, all right, was that type of man. In fact, in the verse I was talking about when he put forth that question, all right, do I seek to please men? Is that what my life is all about? He goes on, he says, but now, all right, I'm not trying to win the approval of men, all right, but I'm trying to win the approval of God. And he goes on in that verse, says, if I were still trying to please men, I cannot or I would not be a servant of God. My life now has changed. I'm not focused on pleasing, all right, the Sanhedrin. I'm not focused on pleasing the Pharisees or what other religious men would think about me, but I am totally focused on pleasing God. Um, I, I came across this quote, Bill Cosby, all right, even though 
all right? Everything happened late in his life, terrible tragedy. But this quote was true, all right? He said one time in one of his speeches, I don't know the secret to success, but I do know the secret to failure. And the secret to failure is trying to please everybody. Can't do it. You cannot do it, all right? And Paul understood this. I am now no longer about trying to please other people, but I'm about pleasing my God. Now, ultimate example of that is who? Jesus Christ. A uh, verse in John 8, 29, Jesus said this, I always do those things that please him. I wish I could say that, all right? That I always do those things that please him when he was talking to his disciples. And that should be our motivation, all right? The question is, how do you do that, all right? How do I live a life that honestly pleases God, all right? Uh, and I want to read the verses in 2 Corinthians. These are three truths that God shared with me, and I want to share with you, all right? If I'm going to have renewal, I need to live a life that is pleasing to Him. But how do I do that in the midst of this world that I now find myself in? So I want you to listen, all right, to these verses, starting in verse, all right, 1. I'm going to read the 11 verses. He says, For we know that... If our earthly house, this tent, he's talking about our body, all right? And he really is using an analogy. It's like a tent, right? One day you pitch it. One day it's going to be folded up and you're going to get rid of it. He says, we know if this earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And he says, for in this we groan. What's this, this referring to? It's referring to the tent, all right? This body in which I live, in which you live. He says, in this body we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. I want to get rid of this body, and I would like to be clothed with my heavenly body, he's saying. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we are in this tent, we groan. Again, saying this, that word groan, all right? Being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed or cease to exist, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, all right? living within you, and he says he has given thus the Spirit as a guarantee. Now, the Spirit of God is witnessing to your heart and to my heart that this is true. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him, well-pleasing to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may receive the things done in the body according to what He has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. So let me give you three truths, all right? I want to live this way that be well-pleasing to my God. How can that be done, all right? And very simple truths. Number one, you only and I can only live a life that pleases God when I live in hope. I have to live in hope. I cannot please God. I cannot be well-pleasing to God if I live in fear and live in despair. I have to choose to live in hope. And I look at this in verse 4. All right, Paul said, our mortality, in other words, this fleshly, earthly body is going to be swallowed up by what? What does he say? By life. In other words, basically he's saying death is not the end. All right? Death is only the beginning of something totally new and something better. 
And so he says we are to live in that hope. The reality is in this life, and I think I don't have to explain, I think we're all realizing this now. He says this in verse 2. He says, for in this we groan. All right? The reality is life is one of groaning. All right? You're not going to escape pain. You're not going to escape pain physically, emotionally. You're going to experience, all right, these times of turmoil. Why? We live in a mortal body. We live in a fleshly body. And this fleshly body is what? It's dying day by day. And it will ultimately, he says, be destroyed. It's like a tent. It's ultimately going to be folded up and put away, all right? Never to be inhabited again, all right? It's going to return to the dust. Solomon, you know, the wisest man that ever lived outside of our Lord, said the dust will return to the earth as it was. And that's going to happen. This body is not meant to live forever. It is earthly. It is mortal. Our eternal hope, think of it, I'm going to live in hope, is not that I'm going to live to 100. It's not that I'm going to live to be 120 or beyond. Can I say this as getting older? That's not a hope. That is a curse. All right? <laughs> that is a curse. All right? Uh, all that I see is the progression of where I am now at 76. I don't even want to imagine what 100 is going to look like, let alone 120, if God would allow me to live. I put up some pictures. Do you have them there? I got one up there for you, Matt. All right? It's a picture. There you are, right? Can you notice any difference? And the three people at the bottom and the three at the top. See, that's what, I mean, I, I look at Luke and I'm going, man, I, he's sort of like me, all right? He, he definitely has aged, all right? Uh, and then, you know, and it, it, it's, it's not pretty sometimes, am I right? Do you have the other picture? I didn't realize Diane put this up, all right? Okay, all right. This happens to be Bill, all right? Look at that hair. Man. I, I, I look at that, so you follow the pictures, right? Then you look at this last picture. It's when I retired, all right, up at uh, uh, Bible Baptist Church up in Hasbrook Heights, New Jersey. See a man there, a little more weight, all right? Ends up has no hair. I mean, there has been times in my life, I'm at the point now, I went through my office and I'm cleaning out things that I've come across pictures and do not recognize they're of me. Do you know how discouraging that can be? <laughs> All right? It has to go, whoa, what has happened? So I'm saying this, and the reality is, my hope, all right, is that I'm going to receive a new, eternal, spiritual body, all right? And my hope is that my redemption not only, and this is reality, my redemption not only includes my spirit, but my redemption includes my body. Do you understand that? My I'm not going to be some floating spirit in the clouds. God has redeemed me totally. Spirit, body, soul. All right? And I have the promise of that. That's why Paul, when he wrote to the church in Romans, said this. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan, here's that word again, within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. As you get older, I'm waiting for that, all right? I didn't understand that as a young man, all right? But I understand it now as I'm getting older, all right? Man from creation, three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. And my salvation is going to include all of me. And this hope gets us through a life of groaning. It was true for the Apostle Paul. It is true for us. In fact, I'm going to say this. Without that hope, it's totally impossible to abandon ourselves to please God, devoting ourselves fully to His will. Think about it a second. We got the virus going on, right? If your hope is that you're not, I mean, your only hope is that I'm not going to get the virus, not going to get sick, and not going to die, 
I mean, you're not going to be able to live a life that is pleasing to God. You're going to be consumed, all right, that I have to do everything. And I'm not saying it's wrong because we are, in other words, to be, in other words, smart about how we handle things. But if that is your only focus, when pain and groaning comes into your life, you're not going to be able to abandon yourself to God, all right? I mean, you think about the Apostle Paul. Did he go through any groaning, by the way? Was there any difficulties in his life, all right? Paul lived in that hope. What do you think gave Paul the endurance to go on? Come on, think about this, right? How do you be, how can you be beat, all right, with a cat of nine tails, rods? How can you be robbed? How can you be abused? How can you be, you know, in the ocean? How can you experience all these things? And I can imagine Paul, as he was getting older, older than I know now, all right, the weather changes, my body aches, all right? I mean, I don't know what it would be getting beat, all right, with 40 stripes, and then be in a cold ocean. I mean, Paul and his pain. What got Paul through that? That he could abandon himself to live a life pleasing to God, all right? It wasn't that he was going to live forever in his fleshly body, but he realized, do to me whatever you want to do in life. But to be absent from the body is to be present in what? with my God. That was his hope. He wasn't bound, all right, in fear. He wasn't bound, all right, to circumstances. In Titus 1-2, he said this, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. He says, I got a promise from God. And literally what he's saying, in the midst of all the difficult times, I'm holding on to that promise. I'm not, my hope is not on a vaccine. My hope is not that everybody's going to love me. My hope is on the promise of God, all right? Doesn't mean you don't take a vaccine, all right, if you believe that's what the Lord wants you to do. But that is not my hope. My hope is based on the promises of God. And if I do not live in that hope, I cannot live a life that is totally pleasing to him. Again, he wrote in Titus. He says, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For when Jesus comes, we will be changed, all right? But we need to remember also, not everybody has that hope. The Word of God says the unsaved, those who have not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, will be eternally separated from God. John three eighteen, Jesus said this to Nicodemus, He who believes on him is not condemned. But he who believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is why the unsaved man reacts differently in the circumstances of life. If you just look at what's going on in society today, you understand what's happening. If you don't have that hope, you don't have assurance, you're scared to death. I mean, you don't know what to do. But I'm saying as a believer, don't got to live that way. I have a hope. And my hope is not tied to this world. It's not tied to what somebody does hoping they make the right decision, right? My hope is in the promises of my God. And uh, I think we need to realize, need to understand that. And we need to realize, I have hope, all right? Each and every, I might not be able to control the circumstances of life or where it leads me. But I got the promise of God that one day, these eyes, this is what Job said, are going to see my Redeemer. And so will you and I, if you have put your faith and trust in Him. So I would say, well, I'm going to live a life pleasing Him. Paul says, you got to have hope. you got to have hope. Number two, you can only live a life that pleases God when we live with purpose. We have to live with purpose. As we live in this earthly house, all right, I'm not just to pass time saying, you know, one day I'm going to go to heaven, all right? And so I pass my time waiting for that moment when I will be with our Lord. My aim in this life is to be well-pleasing to God and bring Him glory. He says, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, whether here or in eternity, that I would be well-pleasing to God and give Him glory. Am I right? 
That's what we're created to bring our God glory. Now, how can that be done? How do I live a life that is well-pleasing to God? The answer is by steadfastly fulfilling His will for our life. You know, God has a purpose for all of us. You and I are not here by accident. You and I are not here at this church by accident. We're not here in Raleigh, North Carolina by accident. God, and I know getting to know, all right, the different people here. We come from all different walks of life, been raised in all different areas, but somehow now today we're here together. That's not by accident. God has a purpose and plan for your life and my life. You look at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, again, the ultimate example. All right, at the beginning of his ministry when he was baptized, what did his father say from heaven? This is my beloved son in whom I am what? Well, please, he's getting ready to abandon himself to the ministry that his father had for him. And as he was doing this, beginning on that road, the father said, I am well pleased with him. In the midst of his ministry in John 8, 29, I read that verse where Jesus said, I always do those things that please him. He said over and over again, I'm not here to fulfill my will, but the will of the Father who sent me. My life is not about me. In fact, Courtney, you shared with me in prayer time that quote, all right? And that really says that you gave the quote. For, it was from Andy Stan. Say that quote. Yourself is too small of a thing to waste your entire life upon. Let me say, we're here for something bigger than me. All right? You are here for something bigger than you. And Jesus understood that. And then in the garden, as he's ready to face the cross at the end of his ministry, remember what he prayed? Not my will, but yours being done. See, Christ pressed on throughout his earthly life, no matter how painful it was, no matter how difficult his father's will was, because he knew, what did he know? He knew his father would not allow him to see corruption. See, there's a verse in the book of Psalms, Psalm 16, verse 10. David wrote this verse, replied to David, but it also applied to our Lord he says, you will not leave my soul in shoal. You will not leave me, all right, again in the grave. And then it says this, nor will you allow your Holy One. If you look at, all right, your Bible, H is capitalized, O is capitalized. It's not referring to David, but it's referring to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. He says, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. He's not going to stay in the grave. He's going to come from the grave, all right? His body's not going to return to the dust. He's going to be raised incorruptible, all right? And Jesus knew that. In fact, in the book of Acts, that's the first message when Peter preached. That's what he preached in Acts chapter 2. He says, men and brethren, he says, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he's dead, buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn with oath to him that is of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. That's what Peter preached. He's talking about this hope. And to please our heavenly Father... We also must commit ourselves to walk in the purpose that he has for us. See, Jesus walked in that purpose because he knew he was in the Father's hands and the Father's will. Even when he died on that cross, he said, into your what? Hands. I commend my spirit. And I'm saying this morning, we need to understand that to live a life pleasing to God, I need to live with purpose. Listen to the Paul. He talked about this. He says, I press on. This is Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. I press on that I may lay hold of that 
for which also Christ laid hold of me. Basically he's saying, I press on to accomplish the will and purpose of my life to which God chose me that I would be a member of his family. For that purpose, if you read in Acts chapter 9, that purpose that he was to bear the name of Jesus Christ before the Gentiles and to suffer for that, bear witness to the Lord. For us, why are we, you think about it, why are we here? Why did God leave us here? Why does God have us here at this time? That seems to be getting darker by the week, right? I believe we are here to be his what? Witnesses. We are here to be his witnesses. There's a verse, Acts 1.8, you should be witnesses to me, Jesus said. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. We're here to show the reality of our faith to those around us. Now you think about this. This world is, is in despair and in fear and in turmoil. If we would really live as people in hope and in purpose, think we'd stick out? <laughs> I mean, people go, what? In the, how, how are you able to do this? All right? We are here to be that witness, all right, of our faith in Christ. And we do so by our words, by our actions, and by the attitude we display. It's not, oh, woe is me, I wonder what's going to happen. It's, praise God, my life is in His hands, and I can trust Him. And we need to live in that way. We only can do that as we run His will, complete His course for our lives, and then we bring Him honor and glory. That needs to be the focus. So I'm saying, number one, to live a life that's pleasing Him, I need to live with hope, and I need to live with purpose, but let me give you a third one, all right? I only can live a life that is pleasing to God if I live with an eternal motivation. An eternal motivation, all right? I need to have the right motivation. I need to have something that, that drives me on, all right? 2 Corinthians 5.10. What does Paul say here in these verses? He said, we must all, I guess that means... Pastor Matt, Pastor Bill, every individual, we must all what? Appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to get a, an appointment. We're going to get an appearance. We're going to come before our God, all right? That's a truth we you can't ignore, all right? One day you're going to meet God. One day you'll stand before him. That's why in Romans, Paul wrote this in Romans 14, 10. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Be careful how you judge others, for one day you'll stand before your God. Romans 14, 12, he wrote again, Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. You talk about motivation, right? You understand this? At the end of life, we're not going to stand before Pastor Matt and give account. All right? We're going to stand before our God. All right? That's our motivation. Now, there's a negative and a positive to that. You notice the negative side, all right, of that motivation. Because what does he say in verse 11, right at the verse 10, that we're all going to appear? He says, knowing therefore what? The terror of the Lord. Now, he's talking about persuading men. What's he talking about? He says, we know what waits the unsaved. This is what drives us on. That's why he says in, in verse you know, 11, he talks about we persuade men. We do everything. It's a strong word. We do everything we can to persuade men to put their faith and trust and jeer into Jesus Christ, because it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. I think we forgot this, all right? We buy into this thing of the world that many roads to heaven. Though there is not, there is only one path, and Jesus is that path, all right? That means a person who has not put their personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ doesn't have the hope that we spoke about. It means that their destiny is eternal separation from God and from everything good. That should drive us on. 
All of us, we have friends, we have family, we have loved ones. So the devil wants to just, you know, to get us to forget about that. Just to lull us into our own, you know, I'm so busy doing this and that and everything else. The motivation is this world, this time here goes very, very, very quickly. And one day we're going to find ourselves in eternity. And I'm telling you, the most important thing we can do is reach out to those that are closest to us. And Paul says that's what our motivation needs to be. He says we need to understand that it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. I don't have time this morning, but read Jesus as he preached. He preached a lot on this, all right? And Paul said, Paul, in fact, Paul said about the Jews, his, his people, he was willing to go to hell, be accursed, if they would be saved. He would give up his salvation if they would come to know the Lord. And, and, you know, and some of us, the reality is we probably can't remember the last time we prayed for people close to us that they would come to know the Lord. Paul says there's a negative side, then there's a positive side because he says in verse 10, for we are all appeared before the judgment seat of Christ and each one of us will receive the things done in the body. The Bible talks about rewards. You're not going to lose your salvation. Now, I don't believe all of us can be rewarded equally. I mean, I understand that. In fact, you know, I used to believe when I first became a Christian, I had this idea, you would watch the cartoons, that heaven would be floating around somewhere, right? But the reality is there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. You understand we're living on this earth. God, it, it, really, his purpose in creating mankind is going to be accomplished, all right? And there's going to be uh, purposes, functions. Uh, I hate to use the word jobs, all right? Because can you imagine wanting to go to work every day, serving the Lord, not getting tired? But there's responsibilities. But there, not everybody's going to have the same responsibilities. You realize there's more than the decision of salvation follows you into eternity. See, I make my decision for salvation today and follow me into eternity. But also how I live my life, that will also follow me into eternity. How do you think God's going to, you know, handle responsibility? Much has been given, much is required. As I have been faithful to him, that will be really what, in other words, he uses in giving me, all right, responsibilities in his kingdom. But I'm going to be rewarded, right? I'm, nothing's going to be taken away. And you know what? I want to live for his honor and glory and have the place that he, that he desires for me. In fact, in Revelation uh, 22, 12, he says, my reward is with me. All right? That's why Paul, his last words, all right, and on this earth, as he's writing to Timothy in verse 6 to 8 of chapter 4, he says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. All right? He says, the time of my departure is at hand. Talking about he's going to die. He says, I fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith. He says, they're laid up for me a crown of right. There's a reward. Now, he didn't serve for the reward, but the reality was there was a reward. In other words, the reality is Paul saying, I don't want to stand before God and have to say I wasted my entire life on myself. He says, I want to stand before him and hear, well done, and be rewarded, even though everything I've done is because of his grace and his power. See, the question this morning, all right, what type of life am I living? Who am I trying to please? Again, I wrote down here, you want to be renewed? Then get refocused this year. Focus on living a life that pleases God. You live in hope. You live in purpose, and you live with an eternal motivation. And if you do that, you'll be in the right relation to what, whatever relation that is with those people around you. But let's determine this morning that we serve him. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Like I said, God gave me this message was I was on a bed in a hot room, feeling a little bit discouraged, all right? Dealing with a lot of emotions. 
And he said, Bill, get up. You have a hope. You have a purpose. Get motivated and serve me. This morning, the reality you need to ask yourself, am I truly living a life to please God? Maybe this morning you need to bow at this altar and get things refocused. We all have to do that. I wish I could tell you, man, I just get refocused once in life. I, it's like a car getting realigned. Bill has to constantly get refocused, all right? Maybe this morning that's what you need to do in the midst of the times we find ourselves. That you need to get refocused. You know what? I got a hope. I got a living hope. I got a purpose for my life. And I got that which will motivate me. Let me ask if everybody would stand. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Nobody looking around. Everyone standing. If God has spoken to you this morning by the Holy Spirit, don't stay where you're at. Come bow before him. Open your heart to him. Allow him to have his way.